Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Waddell, and I am the current holder of the Edna and George McMahon Aquinas Chair in Philosophy here at St. Mary's College. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's McMahon Aquinas Lecture. The lecture is an annual event sponsored by the Edna and George McMahon Aquinas Chair in Philosophy. This chair was established in 1999 by a gift from Joyce McMahon Hank in honor of her parents, Edna and George McMahon. Edna McMahon was a courageous educator in the Chicago Public Schools, and George McMahon was an innovative scientist who was awarded numerous patents throughout his career. Joyce McMahon Hank was graduated from St. Mary's College with degrees in philosophy and art. She received an honorary doctorate of humanities from the college in 1995 and is an emerita member of the Board of Trustees. The McMahon Aquinas Chair was established to ensure that new generations of St. Mary's students would be introduced to the teachings of the angelic doctor and to sustain the spirit of St. Thomas's work, a spirit embodied in a living intellectual tradition that values sincere questions and seeks truth wherever it is to be found, including the spheres of both faith and reason. As current holder of the McMahon Aquinas Chair, it is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. John O'Callaghan. Professor O'Callaghan completed his bachelor's degree in physics at St. Norbert College in Wisconsin. He then earned a master's degree in mathematics, a master's degree in philosophy, and a PhD in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. He began his teaching career at Creighton University and then moved to the University of Portland before returning to Notre Dame, where he's now a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy and director of the Jacques Maritain Center. Dr. O'Callaghan's professional accomplishments include having been awarded first prize in the Review of Metaphysics annual dissertation essay competition, having been a president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and being appointed a lifetime member of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, whose acronym befittingly is PASTA. Professor O'Callaghan's scholarly works include his highly regarded book, Thomistic Realism and the Linguistic Turn Toward a More Perfect Form of Existence, as well as several edited volumes and more than 30 articles and chapters. His scholarship provides careful analysis of traditional topics in Thomistic metaphysics, psychology, and ethics, but also fluently integrates literature, art, and culture. In his most recent work, he has treated themes related to human nature, personhood, and disability, and has devoted sustained attention to the crucially important topics of compassion and mercy. Rumor has it that his current project is a book on mercy. And so we're very fortunate to have Professor John O'Callaghan here tonight to discuss how Christianity made mercy compassionate. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you, Mike. Um, about pasta, I also recently joined the North American Patristic Society. And uh, pasta ordinarily meets in June, and I was hoping that the North American Patristic Society could, um, would meet in, say, late June or July so that I could say that after pasta I went for naps. Um, so thank you, Michael. Two things occurred to me at dinner. Um, as I sat across from uh, David O'Connor and as my old teacher, Ken Sayer, who taught me Plato, for which I'm eternally grateful, uh, were at dinner. And of course, it also occurred to me that more broadly speaking, there are people in the audience who know Greek, and I'm not one of them. Um, my Greek is Greek to me. It's rudimentary. But, uh, so I don't know quite why I had a little bit of Greek in here. There's not much Greek, but there's a little, and I try to explain it. But forgive me. Ken and David and, every, and Richard and everybody else who knows Greek. Um, the other thing that occurred to me was that I once gave a lecture, it was called a lecture, after dinner, 
And uh, someone came up to me afterwards, a friend, and said, you know that was an after dinner talk, right? And I said, I was asked to give a lecture. So um, I am hoping not to bore you with a lecture rather than a kind of funny after dinner talk. Um, so uh, bear with me, and as I say, I hope, hope not to bore you. So I'd also like to thank the community of St. Mary's, uh, the provost, the wonderful provost I had dinner with tonight, the associate provost, um, most especially the faculty who have come, as well as my colleagues from Notre Dame. I'm very honored that you came over, and most especially the students who are here. And finally, I'd like to thank Joyce Hank for her great generosity in endowing the McMahon Hank Chair, as well as this lecture series that I've enjoyed attending so often in the past. I'm deeply honored to be asked now to speak in it um, after having seen who was asked. I, it struck me today that Cardinal Turkson was last year, and uh, well, you know, <laughs> very honored um, after that. So Mike mentioned that I'm writing a book on mercy. If you were to take a look at the contemporary philosophical discussion of mercy, you would find that by and large it's associated with discussions of justice, particularly retributive justice, the punishment of wrongdoers. It is also seen to be somewhat suspect and unjust since mercy seems to be an arbitrary exercise of power and so interferes with and calls into question equal justice under the law. Not to mention that it's often argued that any role for compassion in the exercise of mercy compounds the injustice of mercy because it relies upon the arbitrary compassionate character of the judge or ruler that a malefactor might happen in the luck of the draw to stand before in judgment. The particular story I want to tell you tonight, I believe, is true. And it's prompted by my effort to respond to the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who, like me, objects to the abstract character of the contemporary discussion of justice and mercy. She argues that pity, or compassion, which she claims are the same thing, ought to be brought to bear on questions of justice and mercy. To make her case, she tells a historical story about what she calls the pity or compassion tradition in Western thought, outlining the origins of pity and compassion in the tragedies of Greek drama, culminating in the work of Aristotle analyzing the role of pity in life. That compassion tradition ends with Aristotle, only to be revived in the early modern period with a renewed emphasis upon sympathy in the works of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Adam Smith, not to mention Sophie de Grouchy's Letters on Sympathy. What you might notice in that history given by Nussbaum is the complete absence of the Christian tradition as having any role to play in the compassion tradition that Nussbaum constructs. In fact, she is explicit that Christianity has no role to play in the compassion tradition because she claims it is too stoic and otherworldly to have a genuine concern for the contingencies of life and the fragility of human goods so easily lost that leads to injustice and the need for mercy. It's that objection that I want to address this evening, but I hope doing so won't be as boring as perhaps I've made it sound. I don't want to bore you with a philosopher's research about a philosopher's objection and response. Among other things, I want to distinguish pity and sympathy from compassion and show how there is no compassionate mercy without the particular worldliness of Christianity. It, be, it will be useful to begin by saying just what I mean by compassion. Part of my story is that it is much more difficult to get a handle on what we me might mean by mercy since in the history of the West and in contemporary culture, it isn't entirely clear what we mean by mercy and the lack of clarity involved in our understanding is partially due to not really understanding the role of compassion within mercy. However, compassion alone is much easier to characterize. The English word compassion is just a transliteration of the Latin term compassio and it pretty much means just what it etymologically suggests. Passio alone means passion, and it broadly involves being affected by something. More narrowly, it means to suffer. When I see a delicious bowl of peppermint stick ice cream, I am affected by it. 
and experience a passion for it that is fulfilled in the eating of it. When my father dies unexpectedly, I experience a passion, the passion of sorrow that involves intense suffering. The prefix com in compassio is just a variation on the Latin preposition cum, which just means with. So you might be familiar with the Latin metaphor cum grano salis, which means to take something someone says with a grain of salt. What's interesting about putting that prefix in front of the Latin term, passio, is it immediately gives you a very narrow Latin meaning for the term compassio. It doesn't mean, in general, being affected with. It means quite specifically and narrowly suffering with. Compassion is a state in which one person suffers with another. But it doesn't mean that there are just a bunch of people suffering the same thing together. As for example, we might all suffer the flu together. It means someone is suffering because of the suffering of another. If you have the flu and I am compassionate, I don't suffer the flu. Instead, I am pained in my heart, as St. Augustine would say, because you are suffering the flu. Instead, I, uh, sorry, if my father dies unexpectedly, my brother and sisters suffer that loss together with me. But suffering the loss together is not compassion. It's communal suffering of a loss. However, since it's not your father who has died, you do not suffer the loss as my brother and sisters and I do. But if you experience sorrow at my suffering, then you are suffering with me in the sense of compassion. So compassion doesn't mean having the same suffering as someone else. It means sharing in the suffering of someone else precisely because it is their suffering, not yours. That is its specific character. I take your suffering as my own precisely insofar as it is yours. This painting by Roger van der Weyden called The Deposition of Christ is within a genre of art, whether painted or sculpted, called The Swoon of the Virgin in which typically as Christ dies or is removed from the cross, Mary faints or swoons. What it depicts is her compassion for her son. The thieves who were crucified with Christ died with him and one could say suffered alongside with him, but their deaths did not give expression to their compassion for him, even though the so-called good thief recognized the injustice of Christ's suffering or crucifixion. However, Mary swoons with compassion for her son who has died. She suffers with him without herself dying. If you look closely, the artist communicates this compassion visually by making the positioning of Mary a striking mirror image of the passion of Jesus' body, including the bend in her knees, the curve of her hip, the bend in her arms, her hands, and even the tilt of her head. It's not a copying of the position of his body, if you look at it, it's a mirroring of it. Compassion mirrors the suffering of another, it does not copy it. Now I wanna distinguish compassion from a number of other different states, pity, empathy, and sympathy. Compassion is not pity, particularly in what we mean by that in English. It is characteristic of pity to feel sorry for someone to feel bad for him or her, perhaps even to be deeply upset by the suffering someone is undergoing. But I think you'll agree that we would not say that someone who is pitying someone else is suffering with that other person. The Victorian lady on her way to a society event riding in her coach looks out the window and sees the pitiful and wretched poor in the streets of London and is deeply affected by it, upset by it, and may even remain upset by it to the point of arriving at the society event still filled with pity for the pitiful. But she doesn't suffer with them. She is too distant from them in her likely condescension to be described as suffering with them. However much she pities them, she does not adopt their suffering as her own. She moves on even while still upset. If you adopt the suffering of someone else as your own, how can you move on? 
Compare these two statements. I don't want your pity. This statement is a common reaction of those who are the object of pity. But what about, I don't want your compassion? That statement is not a very common reaction. You know, I've never heard it. So we have to keep pity and compassion distinct. That's a first response to Nussbaum treating pity and compassion as the same thing. Compassion is not empathy. The term empathy is often used loosely. But technically, empathy is the capacity to see and experience some situation as someone else sees and experiences it, to see it from within the frame of reference of the other person, not yourself, to walk in someone else's shoes for a little while, so to speak. But in doing that, I'm not suffering with the other person, but rather like the other person. And empathy has the added aspect of being experienced in situations where to speak of compassion is absent or even totally inappropriate. I, having grown up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, can empathize with Bears fans and how terrible it must be to be fans of such an awful team, seeing them lose year after year after year to my beloved Packers. But that empathy is not compassion suffering with them, nor should it be. I empathize with them at the same time that I celebrate their suffering. In fact, my empathy for them, feeling it as they do, might even elevate my celebration of their suffering, since it gives me an insight into just how awful they feel, an insight that causes me greater joy. A less humorous example, might be the empathy one might have for a father imprisoned for manslaughter because in a rage he killed the man who had been speeding down the road, striking and killing the father's child in the street. I may, I may or may not have compassion for him, but I can likely imagine through empathy what it must have been like for him, seeing it as he saw it. Finally, compassion is also not sympathy. But here the point is a little more difficult to make. There certainly are some instances when it seems that we use sympathy as a synonym for compassion. It doesn't seem odd to say that Mother Teresa was very sympathetic toward the dying poor of Calcutta, although it still seems better to say that she was compassionate. And we might encourage someone to be more sympathetic to the plight of the poor, just as we encourage him or her to be more compassionate. But by and large, the word sympathy is a much broader term than compassion. Compassion suggests a close tie to the one who suffers, a tie that binds one to him or her. Sympathy doesn't suggest being bound to the other. It's particularly important to compare sympathy with compassion because while compassion is a transliteration of the Latin word compassio, sympathy is a transliteration of the Greek word sympathia. I hope you see something interesting there. Passio in Latin means roughly the same thing as pathos in Greek, which when prefixed with sum becomes uh, patheia. And the prefix sum in Greek means roughly the same thing as com in Latin, namely with. And yet, compassio is not the Latin translation of the Greek word sympathia. In Latin, you translate sympathia with the transliterated word sympathia. Throughout the Latin patristic and medieval periods, sympathia is almost never used by a Christian author, occurring perhaps 10 times in the Latin text we have available to us across 1,500 years, compared to the thousands of times compassio is used. Sympathia becomes much more common at the end of the 16th century, perhaps because of the renewed interest in Greek texts in the Renaissance. While sympathy is first used in English in 1576, the first time it is used as a rough synonym for compassion is over 100 years later at the end of the 17th century. I hope this Greek and Latin lesson isn't boring. But it is very important that compassio is not the Latin translation of the Greek sympathia. Why? Because what sympathia means in Greek is mostly a purely natural 
and physical reaction of one thing to another, a kind of harmony or resonance. And this is mostly what it meant when it reappeared in early modern thought. In physics, we'd actually call it harmonic resonance. Pluck a string in a piano and the other strings will begin to vibrate according to their own fundamental frequency if they are tuned right. Aristotle writes a work called Problems and devotes an entire chapter to what he describes as the unsolved problems of sympathy. Here are two of his examples in the form of questions he poses. Why, when one person yawns, does another? Forgive me for quoting this next one, but it's a bit amusing. Why, when a man stands next to a waterfall, does he have the urge to urinate? Parents who have potty trained their children can appreciate that example if they've ever turned on the faucet to encourage their child. An example I like from my own experience is that if I observe, have described for me, or imagine for myself someone falling upon his or her knees and skinning them badly, I always experience a shiver throughout my body. I just did in describing the example. I could count on the fact that I would. That's a sympathetic response that has nothing to do with compassion, even though it involves suffering. Does anyone here know what Couvad syndrome is? It occurs in some men. It involves symptoms like weight gain, nausea, heartburn, abdominal pain, leg cramps, anxiety, restlessness, hormonal changes, and so on. It occurs when they become fathers. Its more common name is sympathetic pregnancy. The role of imagination is a very important factor in sympathy. Consider Sophocles' play Antigone that we all read in high school. Antigone is forbidden by Creon to bury her brother Polynices. In many ways, she is a sympathetic character. We are moved by her plight and the tragedy she undergoes. It does not seem odd to say we sympathize with her character. But would we say that we have compassion for her, that we suffer with her, that we adopt her suffering as our own? Of course not. She's not real, or if she was, she's too far distant from us. Even if we can sympathize with a fictional character, we cannot have compassion for her. We draw near to the character in the imagination through sympathy, but remain at a distance from her the distance between reality and unreality. Even when the other person is real, sympathy is not generally compassion. So again, a boss listening to the story of the hardships of one of her workers and his or her plea for a better salary might have a vivid imagination of those hardships come to mind and say, look, I sympathize with your situation, but there's nothing I can do for you. There's only so much money for salaries. Contrast that with the statement, look, I have compassion for you, but there's nothing I can do for you. There's only so much money for salaries. The first sentence seems ordinary, while the second strikes me as awkward and false, since the boss is not actually suffering with the worker, even though she has sympathy for him. You can be sympathetic and indifferent. You can't be compassionate and indifferent. Compassion is fraught with depth, with moral depth. We criticize ourselves and others for not being sufficiently compassionate toward the suffering of others. We see lack of compassion in the right circumstances as a moral failure, not a physical insensitivity that does not shudder at a gruesome injury on the football field, or the absence of a humane attitude coupled with keen practicality about good business practices. The Rolling Stones sang about sympathy for the devil, not compassion. Compassion for the devil would require that we suffer with the devil, adapting his suffering as our own. Mere sympathy does not require that, thank God. I cannot pursue this here, but one avenue of investigation that I want to pursue is that the early modern philosophers Nussbaum appeals to as reviving the compassion tradition that had died with Aristotle, according to her, reviving it with their talk of sympathy was in fact an effort to distance themselves from the Christian tradition of compassion. A tradition that, as I will argue below, Christianity by and large invented. That's a second response to Nussbaum, treating sympathy and compassion as the same thing. 
What then of mercy? As I mentioned above, mercy is much more difficult and ambiguous to think about. For my purposes here, there are at least two very different senses of the term. Although what I'm trying to argue in my research is that the histories of these two senses have been intertwined and confused at times. So I'd like to turn now to talking about some ancient history. Our English term, mercy, translates at least three different terms from Greek and Latin. The Greek term is eleos, and, it co and its cognates as they are used in the biblical Greek of the Septuagint or Old Testament. Catholic Christians are very familiar with this term since it's the root word for eleison, as in Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, which of course is translated in the mass, in the mass as Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. In the Old Testament context, particularly the Psalms, but other texts as well, God is portrayed as a merciful God in relation to his people, a God who is faithful to the covenant by coming to their assistance. Often in the Psalms, the supplicant is making a plea for God's mercy, in making a plea for God's mercy, is begging to be delivered either from suffering or for protection from enemies who oppress one on every side. It is not generally associated with forgiveness for wrongdoing, but protection from harm or assistance in infirmity. On the surface, eleos is also not generally associated with compassion, suffering with the oppressed, at least not in the Old Testament, although I suspect some scripture scholars might point out to me the need to attend to the foreshadowing of the coming Messiah in the passages of the Old Testament particularly the suffering servant of Isaiah. In any case, God is powerful and faithful to the covenant he has made with his people, and from his power will protect the suffering who call upon his mercy. Still, while he delivers them from suffering, he does not suffer with them. One thing that is interesting about this Greek term is that in Greek pagan authors, eleos does not mean mercy. That is, does not mean the powerful coming to the assistance of someone who suffers. Among pagan Greeks, it means pity. You experience eleos, that is pity, when you see someone very much like yourself suffering an unjust reversal of fortune from good to bad. But it is a passion, not an action. And it does not involve coming to the assistance of the one who suffers. Tragic figures in Greek drama regularly call for eleos, pity from those who observe their misfortune. Sometimes they receive it, but almost never do they receive assistance from those who express pity for them. It's an interesting um, counterexample in Achilles and, Pri and Priam, although it's very complicated. If anything, as Aristotle explains in analyzing the Greek tragic form, the experience of eleos prompts one to turn to oneself in the experience of fear or phobos for oneself. Fear that one could also suffer this reversal of fortune from good to bad because one is very much like the person who suffers. Second, our term mercy also translates the cl classical Latin term clementia, which may also be transliterated into English as clemency. Clementia is associated with the power of a ruler or judge to mitigate a punishment or forgive it altogether. The Roman Stoic Seneca urges upon Nero that he act with clementia in his treatment of those whom he would punish for whatever crimes or offenses they are guilty of. In our terms, Nero should be merciful. However, it's important to notice that because Seneca is a Stoic, when he praises clementia or mercy in this sense, it is not because of a concern for the good of the one who is being punished, and it is not motivated by suffering with the one who is being punished. Clementia expresses a concern for oneself. It's a kind of temperance in the passion that accompanies punishment of wrongdoers. There is pleasure in punishing those who deserve it. Clementia is a temperance in punishment that restrains the ruler from increasing that pleasure by punishing excessively, and so helps the ruler or judge avoid the vice of cruelty. And in saving lives, rather than destroying them, expresses a godlike power. This, uh, just one second. 
This sense of mercy is what Portia has in mind in The Merchant of Venice when she praises it. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Recall that in The Merchant of Venice, when the Duke extends mercy to Shylock, he explicitly contrasts his own mercy with the lack of mercy found in Shylock, who had sought excessive punishment of Antonio by seeking to take his pound of flesh and thus his life. Granting the mercy, the Duke says to Shylock, that thou shalt see the difference of our spirit. What I'd like you to notice in Portia's beautiful soliloquy is the association of mercy with justice, but also power, majesty, and awe, not to mention governing power. Finally, notice how it is associated with God, conceived of as a ruling power, who acts justly in punishment. This is not the biblical notion of divine aleos, or mercy as assistance to the beleaguered. This is Roman Stoic, godlike Clementia, restraining the fury of the ruler, the duke, the king, Caesar, the angry emperor God. This Roman Stoic mercy associated with justice and governance seasons justice, salt and pepper to taste for justice, if you will. Finally, the word that mercy, uh, the word, the third word that mercy translates is also a Latin, classical Latin term, and that is misericordia, which etymologically just means a suffering heart. Again, Catholic Christians will be very familiar with this term, particularly in and around Notre Dame. It's always good to remember that the motto of the University of Notre Dame is not actually God, country, Notre Dame. It is vita dulcedo et spes, which of course comes almost immediately in the Salve Regina. And I'm in memory of Ken Sayer who sang in my Plato class. Salve Regina, mater misericordiae, vita dulcedo et spes nostre salve. Hail Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary, the woman for whom this wonderful college is named. Mary Mother's mercy to us. However, here, if things aren't already confused enough, there's an ambiguity in the Latin term misericordia that has to be sorted out. Originally in Latin, misericordia could mean one of two things. The first sense is closely associated with its etymology, a suffering heart, and means suffering when others suffer. We are struck when we see someone suffering and our heart aches. Augustine, describing the death his mother suffered, says that he felt the familiar tightening in his chest, in and around his heart. That is something like compassion. The second sense is more like the clementia we just finished discussing. Someone in power and authority forgives or lessens a punishment that has been imposed upon a miscreant. The first sense involves a passion, while the second sense is an act. This ambiguity is important for our story. The Roman statesman and orator Cicero, who lived about 100 years before Seneca, used the term misericordia in both senses of the term I just mentioned. He had, a he had at times stoic leanings. So when he discusses the first sense of misericordia, he condemns it as a kind of vice and illness of weak and puny minds. However, when he uses it in the, sense, the second sense of an act of lessening punishment, expressing judicial or governing mercy, he praises it. Typically, he praises the act in the context of orations directed to Julius Caesar. Caesar was well known for not punishing severely or at all those who had waged war against Rome 
and in particular the civil war that had brought him to power. He had adopted it as a political strategy in the hope of discouraging further rebellion from those whom he thought would experience his mercy with gratitude. Cicero, in his orations in defense of such rebels, would flatter Caesar <coughs> excuse me, for his reputation for this practice of misericordia, that is, mercy. Ironically, Caesar's misericordia may well have contributed to his assassination, since it seemed to many of the Roman Republicans that it smacked of imperial arrogance. The malfeasance of rebellion was against the Senate and people of Rome, not Caesar. And so any misericordia extended to these malefactors should come from them, not Caesar. The irony is that at least two of those who assassinated Caesar, Brutus and Cassius, had actually received such misericordia from Caesar, having fought him in the Civil War. In any case, you can probably see the similarity between this misericordia that Cicero praises and the Clementia that Seneca praises. But the story gets even more interesting, if at this point you find it interesting at all. By the time that Seneca is writing 100 years after Cicero, the ambiguity is gone in the use of the term misericordia. Now, in Seneca's time, misericordia just means the passion of suffering upon the occurrence of the suffering of another. This change of usage is important for what Seneca had to say to Nero about Clementia. In order to be absolutely clear with Nero that Clementia is a virtue of temperance to be pursued, Seneca explicitly contrasts it with misericordia. He writes that nothing could be further from Clementia than misericordia, which, like Cicero before him, he condemns severely as akin to the tears of wretched and old women gathered around the prison gates. The passion of misericordia is to be condemned as womanish and weak, while the virtue of Clementia is manly, powerful, and godlike. As Portia, as Portia will say, it is an attribute of God himself, and earthly power doth then show like as gods when mercy seasons justice. So this Roman Stoic mercy is dispassionate. Indeed, in its exercise, it is opposed to passion, not to mention what we know as compassion. So to summarize for a moment, we have three classical terms that are translated into English as mercy. The biblical Greek term eleos and its variants, mostly associated with God's power and assistance to his people, expressing his faithfulness to the covenant. The pagan Latin term clementia, associated with ruling and judicial power. And the ambiguous pagan Latin term misericordia, which is associated with the power of a ruler but also in its ambiguity with suffering when others suffer. When misericordia is used in its other sense to signify suffering with, it is condemned by the Stoics. Eventually, misericordia ceases to be used among the Romans as a term for mercy in Latin. Uh, as terms for mercy, none of these three ancient terms are associated with what we would now call compassion, suffering with another. So if mercy in the ancient world was not compassionate, how did it become compassionate? To see how, I want to talk now about what I will call the invention of compassion, by which I really mean the invention of the Latin term, compassio. One thing Nussbaum ignores in her objection to Christianity as part of the compassion tradition is that at the very least, Christianity seems to have invented the term. To see <coughs> Excuse me. To see this event, we need to turn away from classical Rome and journey to North Africa. Compassio is a term that does not occur in the work of any pagan Latin author, ever, before or after Christ. In terms of the ancient Latin text that we have available to us, it first occurs around the turn of the second century after Christ in the works of the Christian author Tertullian of Carthage. The first occurrence of it involves Tertullian commenting about, upon St. Paul, saying in Romans 8:17, and if sons, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. To say, to say suffer with, St. Paul uses the Greek term sympaskamen, 
which is related to sympatheia. The earliest translations of the Bible from Greek into Latin were being made in North Africa, and Tertullian made his own. And yet, Tertullian does not choose the Latin term symp sympathia when commenting on upon, upon Paul's symposcomen. Instead, he uses the term compassio, which, as I've said, is found in no Latin pagan author. It would be too much of a jump to say that Tertullian coined the term compassio. However, if he did not coin it, it is not too much to say that he likely used a term that arose in the life of the Christian community, perhaps in North Africa itself, a community used to much more severe persecution and suffering under Roman rule than Christians in most of the rest of the Roman Empire at that time. Tertullian takes Paul's comment as a defense of the bodily resurrection and writes, if we suffer with Christ through the flesh, so also it will be through the same flesh that that which is promised for compassion will be received. I want you to keep something in mind for later about these passages from St. Paul and Tertullian. The question for St. Paul seems to be what to do with one's own suffering, insofar as one has adopted the Christian life, and his response is to identify one's own suffering with the suffering of Christ. One is already suffering and one looks to Christ's suffering. We would now say, and sometimes banally, offer it up. The direction of one's intention is from one's own, suffer one's own suffering toward Christ. Tertullian follows him here. Without mentioning mercy explicitly, Tertullian's point seems to be that if you identify your own suffering with Christ's, then God will be merciful toward you. Namely, you will rise in the flesh on the last day. But I'd like you to keep in mind that in introducing for the first time the term compassio, it is not understood as a suffering with those around one who are suffering. It's introduced as suffering with Christ. In effect, what St. Paul is saying is that one has implicitly chosen to suffer with Christ in becoming a Christian, and he is calling the Romans to remember that. Tertullian follows him in calling the Carthaginians, who had been fle Carthaginian Christians, who had been fleeing persecution to remember it also. Indeed, one of his works is called On Flight, and it is a passionate tract against fleeing persecution as a Christian. I think one could plausibly describe this compassion, suffering with Christ, a kind of otherworldly Christian stoicism, giving some due to Nussbaum's objection. However, there's yet another sense of compassio in Tertullian that does look like the sense we have in mind when one takes on the suffering of those around one. It occurs in Tertullian's work on modesty. Tertullian has in mind those Christians engaged in adultery and fornication. He's concerned with certain lax bishops who have been admitting the adulterers and fornicators to communion without proper repentance on their part. He argues that the lax bishops have no such authority to admit them, them to communion without repentance, for it is God who forgives through them, only upon the penitence of the sinner. He does not use any term for mercy here, but one can see that that is what is involved in God's forgiveness of a penitent sinner. It is the mercy of a judge or ruler, like mercy as Clementia praised by Portia. Still, even though mercy comes from God, not the bishop, Tertullian says that the sinner receives something greater from the Christian community than the false communion of the lax bishops, namely the compassion of their fellow Christians. Those who are outside the church because of their grievous sin are surely suffering. The proper attitude of the Christian within the church toward their suffering is or ought to be compassion, that is, to suffer with them. Here we first see compassion in the sense I analyzed at the beginning. I am not suffering separation, someone else is. But the Christian is not to shun the separated sisters and brothers. The Christian is to take their suffering as one's own, precisely as their suffering. Here in Tertullian, one can see the idea of divine mercy as forgiveness in the background, and yet it is not a mercy that is within the power of the Christian to grant, not even the lax bishops. The ordinary Christian thus has compassion without mercy. God has mercy. Now the first explicit use of the term mercy 
in proximity to compassion takes place in Tertullian's fellow North African, St. Cyprian of Carthage. St. Cyprian was a bishop and martyr in the generation just after Tertullian. According to St. Jerome, Cyprian read Tertullian every day and referred to him as his master. The term that Cyprian uses for mercy is misericordia. He uses it and compassio in a situation similar to the one we've just seen in Tertullian, except that Cyprian is concerned with those apostates who under persecution have lapsed from the faith and communion with the church, rather than Christians who are engaged in adultery and fornication. Cyprian portrays the state of apostasy as a state of suffering, quoting St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one member suffers, so also the other members suffer with him. Then in his own voice, Cyprian adds, I am compassionate and grieve for our brothers who have lapsed and fallen prostrate under the infestation of persecution and have inflicted a similar grief, grief upon us to their wounds as if taking away with them a part of our guts. Cyprian is describing a kind of double compassion here. First, as a member of the church, he recognizes the suffering of and is compassionate towards those who have, who have apostatized. Second, as a leader of the church, he also recognizes the suffering and is compassionate for those who did not apostatize, but grieve in compassion for the loss of their brethren. Immediately upon exercising this compassion for the unfaithful apostates, Cyprian adds, to whom the divine misericordia is able to give healing. Here, for the first time, we explicitly see the use of the terms compassion and mercy in close proximity. But like Tertullian, a distinction remains. Cyprian is clear that while Christians should have compassion for the separated sisters and brothers, only God can extend the misericordia of forgiveness. In effect, the compassionate Christian does not have it within his power to extend mercy. Misericordia, at least, at least with respect to the forgiveness of sin. God, who is the just ruler, does. There are two significant points to be made about Cyprian's use of the term misericordia here. First, it is not the use of the term for the passion that Cicero and Seneca condemn for weeping at the suffering of others. On the contrary, it is the use of the term for the act that Cicero uses in praising Caesar for limiting or altogether foregoing punishment, the use that in Cicero corresponds to Seneca's clementia. The second point, however, is that Cyprian associates it with healing the afflicted, not the Roman Stoic temperance of the pleasures of punishment that Seneca had associated with clementia. So this act of mercy is much closer to the Old Testament sense of mercy as assistance for the beleaguered expressed by the Greek term eleos. God's forgiveness of sin is a mercy that comes to the assistance of and heals the sinner, heals the contrite heart. Cyprian's mercy is, also, is thus also not Shakespeare's mercy, which was Roman and Stoic. Recall that Shylock is punished less severely by the Duke so that the Duke may show his difference of spirit, but Shylock is not healed by that mercy. Yet another North African, is part of the story of mercy becoming compassionate. When we look at St. Augustine of Hippo, born in Tagast and raised in Carthage, writing almost 200 years after these events in North Africa, we see him reacting strongly against the traditions of Roman Stoicism in the face of human suffering. In that context, he offers an explicit definition of misericordia. Misericordia is Misericordia is compassion in our heart at the misery of someone else by which we are compelled to help if we can. Here we have the explicit tying of compassion and mercy in the same subject. No longer is it the task of the Christian to be compassionate while waiting for God to be merciful. One and the same Christian apprehends the suffering of another, responds compassionately to it, suffering with the one who suffers, and acts mercifully to the extent possible to relieve the suffering. But notice that Augustine uses misericordia 
for the passion or compassion or, or compassion that Cicero and Seneca had condemned as weak and womanly. This misericordia compel, compels an act that seeks to alleviate the suffering and, and act of mercy. In Augustine, compassion and mercy are no longer distinct, the one pertinent to Christians and the other belonging to God. Human beings in general are to be first compassionate and then merciful. Appealing as it might be to finish the story by giving North Africa uh, in the persons of Tertullian, Cyprian, and Augustine the entire responsibility for making mercy compassion, compassionate, we cannot do so. Augustine was simply reflecting a deed that had already been accomplished before him and after Tertullian and Cyprian. It was a Milanese figure dearly beloved by Augustine, crucial for his conversion, who is responsible for tying compassion and mercy together in the life of the Christian. St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan. The term compassio as a characteristic of the Christian had continued to be used by Christian authors after Cyprian. But it wasn't until the year 394 when Ambrose wrote a letter to the Christians of Milan on the biblical story of Naboth in the Book of Kings. Recall that Naboth was defrauded of his land by Ahab, the king of Israel, and his wife Jezebel. Reflecting upon Naboth, Ambrose condemns the wealthy Christians of Milan for their treatment of the poor, and in doing so, he explicitly ties Compassio and Misericordia together in the same subject. Indeed, laid it down as a virtue for all human beings toward those who suffer. The wealthy Christians of Milan refused to divest themselves of their riches and assist the poor with the proceeds. Ambrose responds unsparingly to their intransigence in two ways. First, he writes of them, perhaps you will say, that you are, say what you are commonly in the habit of saying. We ought not to give to someone whom God has cursed but by desiring him to be poor. Ambrose responds, but the poor are not cursed. Inasmuch as it is written, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is not of the poor, but of the rich, that scripture says, the one who controls the price of grain will be cursed. In his first response, in this first response, Ambrose seems to be saying that if you are going to think of God as a judge who curses and condemns, then you should keep it in mind that it is you who hoard your riches, whom Holy Scripture tells us God curses and condemns. However, Ambrose's second response to the wealthy Milanese Christians shifts the ground away from questions of divine justice and punishment, away from the picture of God as ruler and judge who condemns. He continues, Misericordia is not in the habit of judging merit, but of giving assistance in necessities, of serving the poor, not investigating justice. For as scripture says, Blessed is the one who understands the destitute and poor. Notice that Ambrose uses the term misericordia for the act, not the passion. Where in Tertullian and Cyprian, misericordia as an act had been the province of God as judge and ruler, here in Ambrose, it is the duty of the Christian believers whom he is addressing, those Christians with the power to assist those in need. Not only does God come to the assistance of his people, as in the days of the Old Testament, but so too should the powerful and well off. This misericordia is not Roman misericordia, as Ambrose explicitly distinguishes it from questions of justice and desert. Misericordia is not in the habit of judging merit, not of investigating justice. However, Ambrose does not stop simply with requiring this new anti-Roman misericordia from the Christian community toward the weak and destitute. He immediately adds, who then is it who understands the destitute and poor? The one who is compassionate to him, who faces him as a natural friend, who recognizes that the Lord made both the rich and the poor who knows that he will sanctify his fruits if he will deliver some portion of them to the poor. 
Here, Ambrose explicitly unites compassion and misericordia in the life of human beings, where Tertullian and Cyprian had kept them distinct. As far as the textual tradition of Latin Christianity available to us is concerned, this is the moment in Western history when mercy became compassionate. And we owe it to that wonderful saint so integral to the conversion of St. Augustine. It is little wonder that Augustine follows Ambrose and defines misericordia as he does, compassion in our heart at the misery of someone else by which we are compelled to help if we can. Ambrose does something else when he unites compassion and mercy. He says that compassion is the look of natural friendship. By introducing the notion of natural friendship toward the poor and destitute, Ambrose is expanding the scope of compassion and misericordia beyond the Christian community. It is the expression of a friendship we have by nature, not by sect. In Tertullian and Cyprian, compassion was di uh, directed at a fellow Christian separated by sin from the communion of the church. Ambrose has done two things in one stroke. Compassion and misericordia are extended to all human beings with wh whom one is a, is a friend by nature, and it bears upon all suffering, not simply the suffering of sin and separation from the church. And so Augustine's definition is perfectly general in its application to suffering. It does not ask, but who is my neighbor? That's a third response to Nussbaum. The fragile and contingent worldly goods of the Christian form of life are the other human beings we encounter along the road of life, our natural friends, but particularly the destitute and poor. Now I'd like to finish by saying something about what I've done here. I have pursued a historical story of compassion and mercy through the evidence of the texts of the Bible and leaders of the Roman, pagan, and Christian communities. But it would be a historical fallacy to suggest that the writers of these texts were inventing or creating mercy as compassionate out of nothing and independently of the life of the Christian community itself, as if that community were waiting around to be told what to do by these leaders, even bishops. In the case of the Christian community, it is more plausible to suggest that these leaders were distilling and giving explicit com expression to the forms of life that already animated the Christian community. After all, it is well known that the Christian community from very early on engaged in practices of hospitality directed toward the poor and sick of the Roman Empire. Practices that led over time to hostels and eventually the institutionalization of hospitals. These leaders were more likely engaged in a dynamic back and forth between the practices of the community and their reflective distillations of those practices, calling that community to a deeper and more intentional understanding of the form of life they had committed themselves to and were developing. In effect, faith, seeking understanding, promoting faith. It would also be a mistake to act as though no human being before Christianity felt compassion for someone who was suffering and acted to assist the one suffering, despite the deafening silence of the philosophers on it. After all, Ambrose's actual point with reference to natural friendship is that compassion is a human attitude and mercy a human act, not the narrow privilege of Christianity. What I think can be said, however, is that what happened in Christianity is that this human passion and human act came more and more to be reconceptualized as godlike and made intentional as a way of pursuing the image and likeness of God to which Genesis tells us all human beings were made. And of course the Christian community had a model for this form of life as compassionate mercy to the image and likeness of God. I'll conclude by simply mentioning three. The first is the story in the Gospel of Luke of the Good Samaritan. In response to the question posed by Jesus, or sorry, by the man of the law, but who is my neighbor? <clears throat> the person fallen upon by thieves in that story is simply described in Luke's Greek as an anthropos, the Greek word for human being. In the Vulgate, Jerome translates anthropos as homo, the Latin word for human being. Your neighbor is not a man or a woman. Jew or Greek, 
Roman or Samaritan, but rather the human being who suffers whom you encounter. Aquinas will later say of this story that it does not matter whether it says friend or brother or neighbor. In addition, the Samaritan who comes to the neighbor friend brother's assistance is described with the Greek term, and now I'm going to slaughter this, uh, esplachniste. Sorry, David. Which literally means moved in his bowels at the sight of the man lying in the ditch. Recall how Cyprian had described the loss of an apostate as living, as like having something torn out of your guts. The importance of this description is that in many parts of the ancient world, the bowels were thought to be the seat of love. In the earliest Latin translation of the Bible, including those being done in North Africa, this was often translated as misericordia motus est, which means moved by misericordia. Here with the Latin, the center of love is the heart, not the bowels, but the point is made. Finally, the Samaritan is described as ha poesas ta aleos in Greek and qui fecit misericordiam in Latin, both of which are easily translated as the one who did mercy. The fathers of the church often interpreted the good Samaritan as a symbol of Christ. So the second example of the church's model for compassionate mercy is Christ at the tomb of Lazarus. The shortest verse in the Bible known to all undefeated players of trivial pursuit, like myself, is Jesus wept. He did so just before he raised Lazarus from the dead. He had earlier referred to Lazarus as our friend when he set off to be with Mary and Martha, to grieve with them as also his friends who had lost their brother. First, Jesus wept, showing compassion, suffering with Lazarus who had suffered death. Then he acted to alleviate that suffering by raising Lazarus from the dead. Compassion in our heart at the misery of someone else by which we are compelled to help if we can. Commenting on the tears of Christ, the lacrima Christi, Aquinas asserts in an interpretation that would horrify modern biblical scholars that Christ is, quote, teaching against the Stoics that it is reasonable to weep at the suffering of a friend. So finally, we have the model of Christ's own passion and death. I just said concerning Lazarus, that Christ suffers with Lazarus who has suffered death. Those tears of Christ at Lazarus' tomb, suffering with his death, are a biblical foreshadowing of Christ's own passion and death on the cross, where interestingly, he does not weep. But instead of simply suffering with Lazarus who has suffered death, Christ is suffering death with all of us, acting through that suffering to alleviate our suffering in sin and alienation from God. Does God suffer? Yes, in Christ Jesus who suffers with us. The passion of Christ is God's compassion expressing God's mercy. It was not really Ambrose who made mercy compassionate. It was Christ. Paul had said that we should join our sufferings to Christ's, identifying our suffering with his, becoming like him in his suffering. What the Christian community came to understand more deeply an understanding that comes to explicit expression and teaching in Ambrose is that you are truly Christ-like, truly made to the image and likeness of Christ, or of God, when you turn away from yourself and toward your neighbor, your natural friend who is suffering. When you adopt his or her suffering as your own and then act to alleviate the suffering to the extent that you can. But that was always implicit in St. Paul. For what is it to unite yourself to the passion of Christ, but to unite yourself to the compassion of Christ for all who suffer? You cannot love Christ if you do not love those whom Christ loves. And who is it that Christ loves? Those who suffer. Solve Regina, Mater Misericordia, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Mother of mercy in this valley of tears. Mary mothers mercy to us because she first mothers compassion to us. Thank you. <laughs>
Dr. O'Callaghan has graciously agreed to take a few questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and either Michelle Marlowe or I will bring a microphone to you. I'll, John, I'll let you call the questions. That way I can ignore the people I don't want to take a question from. <laughs> Unless only one raises his hand. David. Well, I could. But. Thanks. I, this is lovely. Um, so, at the beginning of your talk, I was uh, thinking that the the difference between um, <coughs> compassion and sympathy was the sort of lack of intersubjectivity, and this seemed to be confirmed by this move of Ambrose to to say to say that compassion is this thing that you have with your natural friend, and uh, that seems to add the the element of intersubjectivity, but be unlike Aristotelian friendship because it's among unequals and specifically among unequals in virtue. But I'm wondering then what the basis of, if it's a kind of friendship, what's the basis of this kind of friendship? And is this something that we have sort of naturally just in virtue of being human beings? Or if this is specifically a moment of grace or something theological? Uh, in particular, like a kind of elevation of what we have in friendship and, you know, set apart from, say, friendliness in Aristotle, which is a kind of simulacrum of friendship, but not actually rooted in something uh, real. Yeah. That's imitation. So, so the basis for the question, for those who don't know, is that Aristotle, um, in the highest form of friendship, uh, describes it as kind of friendship between equals in pursuit of a common good, a common activity, um, and you have to be strong and healthy and basically relatively well off to have this sort of friendship because otherwise you're trying to, um, and there's David looking at me with his fist on his chin, so I'm a little worried. But otherwise, you know, you're too occupied trying to live, uh, uh, get your daily food and so on and so on. Um, and so it's rare, right? And here you have Ambrose talking about natural friendship. Um, there is an element in Aristotle where he does sort of talk about kind of a natural affinity to people you occur uh, that come along the road as strangers and so on. But this is a problem that Aquinas actually uh, addresses. And since this is an Aquinas lecture, and I said almost nothing about Aquinas, I'll say something about him here. Um, he faces the objection that. Um, uh, you can't treat your enemy as your friend because that's a kind of lie, precisely because your enemy is your enemy. And to treat them otherwise is to sort of lie. And that's where he brings in this notion of natural friendship. Right? Um, and the one worry is that that can be a kind of empty humanitarianism. right? So uh, I don't see any of my Kant professors in class, but a kind of love of humanity but no human being in particular as a moral kind of aspect as opposed to sort of pursuit of particular happiness and so on. That it can look kind of empty to talk about your natural, uh, natural friendship being any human being whom you are human or your friends by birth, by being born human. Um, so one thing to, well, in the first place he says, well, of course this natural friendship is um, distinguished by relations of proximity. It isn't a kind of empty humanitarianism. It's mom, it's uh, the guy next door, it's the beggar, um, and these are all particular relations of, hum of uh, particularity, well, that's redundant, um, that specify these things and then call for the judgments of prudence with regard to what is the relation that is particularized. But I do think that Thomas, and I think probably Ambrose, though I don't know that he talks much more about this, um, I think it is the case that in Aquinas, uh, you don't choose who your friends are. You live up to that, right? Or you don't live up to it. And so in that respect, it isn't like the, friend, the particular friendship of the well-off, the powerful, um, the healthy, the strong, uh, those who have the time for, you know, these great pursuits and so on, that uh, friendship is the fundamental characteristic of being human. Right? You can fail to live up to that fundamental characteristic of being human. Okay? Um, you can choose to fail to live up to it. But it does set a kind of norm um, that is not chosen. Um, we do not choose who our friends are. 
uh, we fail to live up to it or we succeed in living up to it. So I think it is that um, deep in their conception of human nature. And in that regard, I mean, the distinction between the theological and, say, the philosophical kind of disappears because then the question is, what's the goal of that friendship, right? And then we get into questions of nature and grace that the theologians in the room will have a lot more interesting things to say than I can. Does that address what you're trying to get at? Mike, up here in front. Is compassion an act of the intellect or of the will? Ah, very good question. So, <clears throat> um, this gets into certain technicalities, um, but so passions would be um, in the des, des, uh, there, Richard, that third glass of wine. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to say it. the. Des, does the appetitive, there we go, I was going to say the desiratative, uh, but the appetitive powers, that is the desiring powers, right? Um, but in the way in which Thomas thinks about this, um, understanding provides the kind of intelligible form of the desire, okay? Um, it makes uh, it a desiring as, say, seen. So we have both the sense desires, and then he att attributes to will, it's a faculty of desire but related to understanding, okay? So the desire will always be of something either at the level of sense, um, of something uh, cognitively apprehended by sensation, right? The peppermint stick ice cream, okay? Or at the level of the cognitive apprehension of understanding, and in particular, understanding the good of the thing, right? And that understanding informs the desiring of the will in the case of compassion. So Thomas actually will talk about two kinds of compassion. And one of them, you could say, is more like sympathy, right? That is, you know, the sort of sense reaction to things. Some people are revolted by certain things and some people weep at them and some people are completely indifferent to them at the level of a kind of sense apprehension. But then there's the sort of understanding of what's going on here, right? Um, if it's a surgery, you might be, you might have this kind of, oh, the poor, and without anesthetic, say, in a war theater, you might have this kind of sense compassion for that kind of pain, but your understanding might actually inform you that that's not a bad thing, however painful it is, and that may heighten your compassion precisely because it would be good that you not be in this, or the person not be in this situation. So for Thomas, the will is the seat of what we would call love, right? He thinks there's love both in sense, desire, and the will, but what we call love is at the level of the desire of the will. And so the compassion that's kind of particularly important here would be a state of the will informed by one's understanding of the situation. Does that help? One of the interesting distinctions he makes, though, that I came across um, recently is between antecedent passions and consequent passions. He asks this question about whether or not, because he's, he's not a stoic, right? Passions, both of the sense desire and of intellectual desire, are part of human life. And one can act prompted by a passion. Okay? That would be an antecedent passion. And he, one of the questions he asks is, are, is um, acting from a passion, that is an antecedent passion, is it praiseworthy or is it to be blamed? And he says, well, it's not to be blamed necessarily. It might be something bad, but it, by its very nature, it's not to be blamed. Um, but he says it's not particularly praiseworthy either. Right? You know, you just kind of moved um, without much thought and so on. Um, but then he says, um, on the other hand, to, mo to, to act from, uh, sorry, not act from passion, but to act with passion, meaning the pa character of the passion follows from the understanding and the will and the love. He says, if the object of that is good, then that is praiseworthy, right? And why is it praiseworthy? He says, for two reasons. It's a sign of the depth of the love one has for another that one acts with passion 
and it also likely makes the act more efficacious. Why is that important? Well, because Christ's incarnation is God not acting from a passion, because the philosophers in the room will point this out, the impassibility of God as such, but that's a consequence, Christ's compassion is consequent to God's understanding and love. So it's a consequent passion, and by, for that reason, praiseworthy. So God, so God acts uh, not from passion, but with passion. And so when we do, that's when we are like God and God-like, and to be praised as images of God. I sat across from David O'Connor at dinner, and the, about midway through, I couldn't eat anymore because I suddenly panicked and thought, what the hell am I doing? So David O'Connor, who teaches ancient, and I'm constantly, so any mistakes I made here, I attribute to David O'Connor because I'm const, <laughs> constantly asking him for help in understanding the Greeks. I would like to suggest a resource in Aristotle that I think uh, opens this up in uh, directions that you would find congenial. So uh, start from the, uh, the story from the Gospel of John about the raising of Lazarus and Jesus wept. Um, a striking aspect of the account is that Jesus was stirred, uh, he was stirred up in no small part because everybody else was stirred up. Mm -hmm. That is, Jesus, uh, he wept because others were weeping. Right. And so uh, there's a sense in which Jesus' own uh, passion, his own grief, his mourning, was triggered by what the other people were doing right. right by what was going around him and uh, this might point in the direction if you're thinking of Aristotelian resources for thinking more about this not so much to things in the ethics but to the poetics and to Aristotle's account as he says at the beginning of the poetics that human beings are uh, essentially mimetic animals that we imitate, and among the things that we imitate are each other's uh, griefs and sorrows. Yeah. So that uh, if imitation is itself cognitive, that it's one of the ways we understand things, then the very distinction between, say, uh, the what's in the feeling and or what's in the will and what's in the understanding, uh, whatever analytic use it might have, uh, might not have very much descriptive use. Mm -hmm. That in so far as our response is through uh, mimesis, uh, imitation of other people's experience, and that that is both feeling and understanding them, uh, it may be that there are more Aristotelian resources that fit exactly the kind of account that you and Ambrose want to give than it, we can squeeze out of the more technical language of practical reason where we get these distinctions between understanding and will. Yeah. Yeah, and no, th that's well taken. Um, you know, um, I was sort of engaged in this kind of... Um, making fine distinctions, for instance, between sympathy, empathy, um, pity, and compassion. But um, one thing I would say about Thomas is um, it's sort of the Humpty Dumpty problem. It's not just Thomas, right? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty took a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, what that poem is about is actually a rhyme about uh, the problems of analysis, right? in order to understand the thing, you first break it down, and the problem of breaking it down is how do you get it back together? Um, and I do think in the case of Aquinas, but I think also presumably in the case of almost any great philosopher or theologian, is it's their ability not to lose the reality of the unity of human life. 
right? That it isn't these parts being put together in this nice kind of jigsaw puzzle way. Um, these are ways of sort of seeing the, the, the whole unity. And so that's a very good um, point that's taken. I mean, the only thing I might say, there's, there's some, there's, it's a fun, well, it's an interesting story because Christ does seem to change from when he's kind of like holding off going. He hears that Lazarus is dead and he seems to be not that particularly concerned. He's kind of busy. Um, they say, but Lazarus is dead. And he says, that's all right. He's just sleeping, right? And he, he doesn't, you know, he's going to go, but I mean, he's, just, he's, he, he's sleeping. And of course, he knows he's dead, but he's, he's sleeping, right? So it's a kind of indifference, almost, it seems. But then by the time he goes and he sees all those who are weeping, including Mary and Martha and all of the other friends, and they're all his friends, um, that seems to be a kind of key moment where he now weeps, right? Because it's not he's sleeping. I mean, look at all this suffering, right? The only thing I wouldn't want to lose sight of is that there's something about the idea of suffering with there that goes beyond um, imitation, right? So that, so that um, it's, it's not quite the example I used of, say, when my, when my father unexpectedly dies, that we're all kind of um, engaged in a communal suffering at his loss. I think there's still an aspect of, though, he's not just engaged in a kind of communal suffering there. It's this suffering with them, right, and, and, and compassion, right? So it goes into compassion, however much it may start as a human reality. Because one of the things that Thomas emphasizes in his commentary on that passage is that, um, and you know, it looks very scholastically neat, but he says, look, I mean, Christ suffers in his humanity. The compassion is in the humanity. And then he acts to alleviate the suffering in his divinity, right? So that, um, but it's the one Christ, right? I mean, these aren't little agents within him, right? But it's because he's human that he can have that experience of coming upon his friends and moving from the idea that, well, Lazarus is just asleep to actually sorrow. And sorrow, um, communal sorrow, but also sorrow for him, and then acting. So it's a. I, I think you're right um, that I should pay more attention to that. But yeah. Well, our friends from Sodexo have prepared a lovely reception for us in the back. I invite you to join us for food and fellowship. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out on this very cold and snowy uh, evening and ask you please to join me in thanking one more time John O'Callaghan for his excellent lecture.